Hey, hey, what is up, guys? It is RB and Hardware. In today's video, we're gonna put together a $700 mini gaming PC using the following parts. Now, I'm gonna show you guys step by step how to put this PC together, and then we're gonna look at the performance so that you get a better idea what to expect in case you decide to build your next PC using the same parts. Now, all PC components you see that I'm using in today's video are linked up down below in case you wanna check them out. Now, spending about $700, you're getting a PC build that is fast enough to crank the settings up all the way to Ultra at 1080p in pretty much all games tested. Now, 1440p is also possible thanks to 6 gigs of VRAM. And just a sneak peek at the performance, it shows that we're able to run all games tested with very smooth frame rate. But yeah, we're gonna look at the gaming performance in much greater detail after we completed this build. Anyway, inside this machine, we find a quad core CPU, a graphics card. From team green a super fast m.2 storage device 16 gigabytes of ram and everything housed inside this sleek and minimalistic and xt case now before we get started be sure to drop a comment let me know what you thought about this video drop a like if you enjoy this content and make sure to subscribe to never miss an episode all right we're kicking off the build with cpu ram and motherboard and on today's menu we find one of the cheapest b450 mini itx ports round this is the msi gaming ac Plus. Plus. and as we can see yeah this is a small puppy but despite its sheer size it's got everything you would ask for without yeah breaking the bank a motherboard is one area where you can save a ton of money opting for a cheap motherboard gives us more money over for a better graphics card and cpu so to no surprise this is a four core cpu with smt effectively four cores and eight threads in total this one's got a base clock at 3.6 and a turbo of 3.9 gigahertz having a look at the gaming performance we see that our 4 core cpu doesn't disappoint here now although the 3100 can't compete with the more expensive picks as we can see it is still a fantastic cpu in a cheaper system with a graphics card that is priced around two to about 300 dollars open up the motherboard box we see that it comes with a so-called retention frame but since we're gonna use a cooler with springs we're gonna have to remove Move the retention frame from the motherboard. Now it is time to install our processor. First, you want to open the metal arm. Secondly, you want to locate what is looking like a golden triangle on the processor. And there happens to be an exact triangle printed on the motherboard socket as well. And so, what you want to do is you simply want to turn the CPU so that these two triangles match up. Then, you simply drop the processor into the socket and gently move the metal arm all the way down until it locks in place. And voila! Our CPU is installed. Now inside the CPU box also comes a heatsink or a cooler and this cooler is actually not really that bad if you aren't interested in doing you know any heavy overclocking for example and I actually don't see any reasons not to use this cooler as it's going to save us a couple of dollars and the cooler installment is also very simple. Now before we place it on the CPU I highly recommend removing the outer frame and that we rotate the fan by 90 degrees. This this is just so that we get enough clearance between the cooler and the RAM kit. Now, this is the very first time you're installing the CPU cooler, it should have some thermal grease pre applied, and you don't need to apply some thermal grease on the CPU lid as you see I'm doing right now. So, gently position the CPU cooler so that the four spring screws on the heatsink line up with the four holes on the back plate and once aligned carefully place the heatsink onto the cpu using a screwdriver turn the spring screw half a turn clockwise to ensure that the spring screw makes a connection with the back plate then follow a diagonal pattern across the cpu cooler like this to further tightening its spring screw with a full turn and once all four spring screws have connected to the back plate tighten them until you feel resistance then check the CPU cooler to ensure that it's uh, properly secured to the motherboard. Lastly, you don't want to forget to connect the fan power cable on the CPU cooler to the CPU fan header on the motherboard. For system memory, we're gonna go with the Corsair Venience LPX because of high quality and stability with the Ryzen platform. But that being said, there are a few additional picks that I would highly recommend as well. And those are linked up down below for you guys. Now these sticks are rated at 3200 MHz and this can give you a few more FPS compared to a cheaper clocked kit. Let's say a 3167 kit for example, as we can see from this example. Installing these is 
as simple as it looks and there's only two slots available here and we're gonna use them both so simply pull back the toggle uh, on the upper side and plug them in just like so in order to install our M.2 drive, we first need to locate the M.2 slot, which we find right here on the opposite side of where we installed our CPU. Gently slide the M.2 unit into the socket like this, then take the little screw and hold it down like this and unscrew it down until it stops. And now we can go ahead and move our uh, motherboard assembly if you like and install it in our case. And in this build, I ended up picking the NZXT H210i for $99. Now, this case comes with a so called smart hub as well as a pre installed LED strip and two 120 fans and support for two additional 120 or 140 that you can install at the front. In case you aren't interested in the extra features, there is a variant available without the smart hub and the LED strip, and this one is selling for $30 less. I know some of you guys aren't fans of the H series lineup from NZXT because of the lacking airflow, which I totally agree with. There are definitely better airflow cases out there, but trust me guys, after benchmarking this machine for hours, I never went higher than 67 or I think it was 68 degrees on the GPU, which are, yeah, perfectly fine numbers. Now for I.O. at the top we find two USB ports, a power button as well as a mic and audio. And there is room to fit a 240 radiator at the front if you want to. Alright, so a couple of things we have to do to prep the case. And the first thing we need to do is untie these four thumb screws in order to get access to the inside. Next we're going to install our I.O. shield that we find inside our motherboard box. And this one goes in from the back of the case with these circular audio ports you see here located at the bottom. Next up, we're going to install our power supply. And for today's build, I ended up choosing the CV550 from Corsair. Make sure to flip the PSU so that you get the fan facing downwards, then gently slide it into place and secure it using four screws that comes provided by NZXT. Now it is finally time to install our motherboard, but before we do that, to make things a lot easier, you want to locate this 8 pin ESP or CPU power and route this cable all the way up to the top left side corner of the case. Now with the CPU cooler installed, we can just grab onto the CPU fan and slide the whole assembly into place. And I recommend having the case laying down when doing this. Now take this 8 pin power cable and plug it in to this connector. Now it is especially important that you do this now because otherwise it's going to be a whole lot trickier to do this once the motherboard has been installed. Speaking of installment, we're gonna use four screws that comes provided by NZXT. And before we move on to a graphics card, now is actually a good time to connect the chassis cables that takes care of the front audio, the USB, as well as the power button. Let's start with USB 3 and this is what this connector looks like. The connector is located onto the far right side of the motherboard. Next in line we have this USB connector and this one goes to a connector that is located right next to the USB 3 connector. Moving on to front panel connectors and this cable goes to the left side corner. Lastly, we cannot forget the front audio right, and this is what this cable looks like. And you find the connector right underneath the front panel one. Alright, so a lot of cables so far, and I promise you guys this will be the last and probably the biggest cable of them all, the 24 pin power for our motherboard. And this one goes to a connector uh, that you find on the mid right side of the motherboard. Now it is finally time to install our graphics and for today's build we find a GTX 1660 Super, this one being from a VDA called Super. Uh, SC Ultra Gaming. Now the 1660 Super comes with 6GB of GSX memory, which is good enough for 1440p gaming. And you're going to see in just a second how powerful this $230 card actually is. Right now, however, yeah, the prices for GPUs in general have spiked through the roof, and, and this isn't just related to the 1660 Super, but all GPUs in general, and the high demand and low supply is unfortunately causing this. But once the GPU makers starts meeting the demand, we should see prices falling back down. So hopefully this will happen any day now. But yeah, it is a sad day to be a 
PC gamer for sure. Anyway guys, keep in mind that if you're planning on using this case, uh, you need to be aware of that the GPU cannot take up more than two PCIe slots. Be aware of that. Anyway, plug in the graphics card and take this dual PCIe cable and plug it in to our graphics card just like so. And what is left to do now is to flip the case around, whack on the back side panel, and we have officially completed our $700 mini gaming PC monster. And if you did everything right, your system should power on. So let's fire up some games and find out how it performs. Now on your screen now we're looking at the performance numbers that I've gathered from today's build and I ended up running 15 games and overall yeah I'm very happy with these results but yeah let's dive a bit deeper with some of the games tested and let's first take a look at that Stranding running at 1080p with the highest settings possible and as we can see we're running with an average of 95 fps with 1% low at 71 fps moving on to CSGO and here we're opting for max settings once again at 1080p this results in around 190 to 167 fps on average and if you want to opt for competitive settings you're gonna see far greater numbers here doom eternal is next up and once again we're running maxed out 1080p resolution and this results in about 100 fps and almost 77 fps at one percent low overwatch is next up and running at 1080p highest available settings and this results in about 83 fps on average Valorant, Valorant runs with an average of 185 FPS. Looking at the settings, we see that I went for everything at maximum settings here. Call of Duty Warzone at 1080p runs at 95 FPS on average, using once again the highest available settings. Cyberpunk 2077 runs with an average of 59 FPS with everything turned up to high. Now this is a fairly demanding game so I would probably settle for 1080p for this title and if you want to go a bit higher let's say 1440p I would look for a slightly higher end graphics card such as a 3060 GPU instead. Again, all PC parts can be found down below. Now, I am starting up a Discord server, and if you want to be a part of this fantastic community, you definitely want to join the Discord server. And here, we're going to discuss everything related to PC gaming, issues, and everything in between. And so, if you guys have any questions, you can definitely reach out to me here as well. you find the link to the Discord down below. Now, watch either of these two videos, and I will see you guys in the next video.